Hello, welcome to this series of vlogs and podcasts where I, uh, my name is Mark Deuze, I'm a professor at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where I interview and talk with um, friends and colleagues in media studies all over the world, people whose work I, I follow, I'm a fan of, I use in my teaching and in my research, and who I just want to get to know a little bit better through this medium of the vlog and podcast series. And today I have two very dear friends as guests um, in this episode where we primarily talk about uh, community media, the role of community media in society, on looking at media as a force of good, um, at, um, um, uh, and, and, and discuss especially how important it continues to be to look beyond all the beautiful shiny new toys and messages and content of the media to what people are actually doing with media and then finding out people often don't use media the way they're supposed to. And that's where the fun begins. Uh, my guests today are Tanya Bosch and Ali Rennie. Tanya is an associate professor and associate dean for research at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, she was a Fulbright Scholar at Ohio University in the United States, did her PhD there as well, um, was a station manager and program manager for the very well-known South African community radio station Bush Radio. Uh, she still has her own radio show uh, at um, um, uh, another community radio station in, in uh, South Africa and um, does uh, a lot of research on community media, on health communication, on youth and mobile media, on identity and social networking. She has a brand new book coming out with Routledge uh, on social media and everyday life. Um, and our, our, my second guest is Ellie Rennie. And Ellie is a professor, a future fellow and co-director of the Digital Ethnography Research Center at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, where she's also a member of the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub and an associate investigator in the AR Center, ARC Center for Excellence for Automated Decision-Making and Society. She currently works on a project uh, called Cooperation Through Code, which looks at um, social and policy implications of automated decision-making technologies, including blockchain. Um, um, she has a forthcoming book on Wi-Fi with Polity Press, together with Julian Thomas and Rowan Wilkin, and her 2018 book with Anna Patlika, um, uh, so Using Media for Social Innovation, is available in open access, and I consider it one of my Bibles. It's a, a book that I keep coming back to in my work and in my research. I hope you enjoy this this conversation with Ellie and Tanya, um, um, and um, um, uh, uh, get to know them just a little bit better. If you have questions uh, um, or comments, please uh, leave them uh, on YouTube or or, or, or contact me uh, or contact Ellie or Tanya. And uh, uh, I hope you enjoy the ride and and check out the other episodes of this series as well. I'm um, I hope there's something there um, uh, that'll make you smile. Lovely. So thanks uh, uh, again for, 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 for doing this, for sitting down from Cape Town and from Melbourne and right here from sunny Northumberland in the UK. And maybe we can just, just get started immediately with talking a little bit about um, what drives and motivates your work, right? Both of you have had a, a, a long history of your work um, working in, about and with community media. Um, um, I mean, you're not just doing research, you're, you're also very much sort of advocates for communi community media. You participate in community media in different ways by monitoring and observing them, by, by helping setting them up, by promoting them, by being on the board. I mean, Ali, you've been on the Community Broadcasting Foundation's board for a very long time. Um, um, and Tanya, I mean, you're on the board of Fine Music Radio. Um, can you talk, both of you, just a little bit more about the roots of that kind of participation 
and 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 this balance that you strike between uh, doing work on community media as a scholar and as an academic as well as a participant and an advocate like how do you balance these or or are these two two sides of the same coin because you're working on community media i actually find it interesting that you describe me as a an advocate mark because I started researching community media because I was quite conflicted about it. I'd been mm -hmm. volunteering at a community TV station and many things had gone wrong. It had been on the brink of collapse many times over. And, um, and there were, it was highly political. And you know a lot of troubled times um, were experienced as well as really fantastic things that were occurring. So I, I, I went into my PhD PhD in order to try to work through that in a way to try and figure out if this thing did have a future because I wasn't actually sure at the time. Mm -hmm. I think when I started to observe it uh, as an academic, I felt more and more that it really wasn't about me <laughs> mm -hmm. and my particular experience or what I wanted to see in the world. It was what other people wanted to do in the world and what mm -hmm. they wanted to say and what kinds of infrastructures are required to make that happen. And when I say infrastructures, I don't just mean the transmission towers or the spectrum, all those things. Uh, it, it's, it's also the policies, the regulations um, and uh, the standards and conventions and ways of working and all of those things that go into making community media. So when I, um, when I, went through the, those phases of doing research. Um, after that, I started working, in fact, with Indigenous broadcasters, which was a very different experience. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, as you say, I, I got involved in the Community Broadcasting Foundation and felt I had to step back from being a, a community media scholar because of just the conflict there of handing out up to $20 million a year to community broadcasting stations. <laughs> And, and also um, researching it, that, that, that didn't feel quite right for me. So that was the point where I decided that I could probably do more for it from, the, from a practitioner perspective, in this case, um, within that foundation, as opposed to uh, through my research. But that said, I do think that um, research is incredibly important and necessary, and I probably feel that more so now, having been on that, um, I suppose, more working side of things. So the participation in it um, in, is almost, I mean, it, uh, the way you describe it, it almost seems like it's almost necessary to, to have that experience to actually get a, a, a better appreciation of what community media is all about. Absolutely. And I still do that in the other areas that I research. You know, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of research on blockchain and I just find myself throwing, I just throw myself into these crazy protocols to, mm. to just figure out what they are and who's involved and why people are doing it and how they work. And I think it was the same for me with community media research. I had to be involved in order to know what it was and why it mattered. And um, I think that that is incredibly important. I'd probably describe myself more as an observer participant than a participant observer. I'm in there observing and doing at the same time. How, how's that for you, Tanya? Because you were a station manager before you became an academic, am I right? Or, or, or did that always happen parallel? So, yeah, sort of the other way around and, and in that sequence. So I actually um, accidentally fell into community radio in a sense because I always wanted to be a journalist. I think as a young person, I had this very idealistic normative notion of the news media. Um, and then similar to Ali, um, was a volunteer at a community radio station in South Africa called Bush Radio. And that's where my, my love of community radio kind of grew. Um, and I think through my work in community radio on the ground as a young person back in the early 1990s, actually, I started to see um, the power of this kind of local media, you know, and um, how it was really giving a voice to, to a completely different um, community in the city. 
um, how it was um, portraying completely different narratives to what mainstream media was 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 putting out there. Um, and that's when I really got excited about um, community radio and then went and did a PhD, a master's in international studies and a PhD in, in communication and did a thesis on community radio. And that's actually where I started to experience the same disconnect um, and frustration in the sense that Ali talks about mm. because I was learning about all these theories of behavior change and these models for the way things ought to work, except they don't really work like that on the ground because there are real people involved and there are infrastructural challenges and there's there are time constraints and there's not enough money, you know, to do formative research or to pretest um, public service announcements or, or to do that sort of thing. So for me, there was also quite a bit of grappling between that academic theory as one who had um, uh, approached community radio in a scholarly kind of way um, and actually been present on, on the ground. So it was sort of that early 1990s working as a producer and a newsreader and a, and a young journalist in the community radio station, then going to do the PhD and then coming back as a station manager and experiencing a, a lot of kind of um, frust frustration, you know, because it's very hard often to, to put into place um the the kind of normative theory that 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 you know is is associated with with community media um, and maybe just to add um mark and, and mm -hmm. ali I, I would agree with ali's perspective that um they kind of work together there's there has to be this balance i think between the academic scholarly work and the the kind of under underground work i mean for me academic research comes from a genuine kind of curiosity about the world and the things I, I observe around me. Um, so in order to do work that is meaningful, I think, and, and, and maybe that's being a bit optimistic, um, but I really think that in order to do work that really has some kind of meaning, um, you have to have kind of one foot rooted in the real world, so to speak. Yeah. It, 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 I want to come back to that real world argument uh, uh, next, just in between. Uh, I mean, in, in, in our time, I mean, everybody's talking about our digital environment and digital culture and internet and, and, and smart media or whatever. And, and it almost sometimes feels like local and community media get, get sort of like bowled over by our sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think Nicholas Garnham back in the day would call it fetishization of the big media or the big issues. And uh, but especially, I mean, I, I mean, I, as somebody who's used to live in South Africa, I distinctly remember Bush Radio. Bush Radio is, is really well known and, and a powerful voice. Uh, I mean, and I can imagine, to Ali, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that especially for in the indigenous communities, community radio is is huge, is incredibly important. And of course, we all know how significant the role of radio is throughout Africa, but also Latin America. So, 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 what is this? I mean, do you still feel like you have to sort of defend your own research agenda on community media, even though it was in the past? Or, 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 or I mean, what is this? I mean, it almost also seems from what you just said as well, is that the lessons we can learn from how community works and or if it doesn't are incredibly useful for all any other consideration of the stuff that we study, especially in the digital context. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I think the um, look. I, when I think about community radio in Australia, it, what is one of the very impressive things which people here don't understand, as I suppose the digitalization of media platforms has ex has continued and and grown, and you know we now have blogs and podcasting and all the rest of it, and and this like, radio feels very old fashioned. And we have all these other ways of listening, which are more convenient, but actually audiences for community radio have grown in recent mm. years, not, not decreased, like they have for commercial radio or even the national broadcasters. So for some reason, people are looking for more local content and they, they want to experience what's going on in their communities or they want to hear voices that are familiar to them. I think with Indigenous radio, Michael Meadows once wrote that um, it's not alternative media for Indigenous people. It is their mainstream media. And I have mm. to say, I completely agree with that from the work that I've done. Um, and Dot West, who is uh, one of the pioneers of Indigenous radio in Australia, once said to me that for her, 
um, Galari TV, which is the local TV up in Broome, uh, it's important because it puts them at, at the center of things instead of always being at the periphery. And I, I, I totally get that. And they're at the, mm. like geographically, Broome seems to be at the periphery of Australia. It's very, very far away from East Coast cities and the rest of it. But also, you know, the, the issues that you're dealing with in a way. So uh, she, was, she was absolutely right about that. Um, yeah, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that, Tanya. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a really interesting one. And I think that community media, we've got to think about community media, I suppose, as part of a broader ecosystem. Um, and I think it has a lot of power and it doesn't mean that it has, it, you know, people people consuming and participating in on social media and online platforms doesn't give community media less power. In some ways it can enrich, um, you know, community media, which has multiple spaces then, um, with which to engage with people, you know. So I think I would think of it as a kind of part of a much broader ecosystem where people might be checking, you know, people in an African context might be looking at Facebook light in the morning when they wake up and then tuning into their local community radio station and maybe tuning in in the lunch hour to the national, the national broadcaster to listen to national news and then tuning back into the local community station. So kind of subscribing to that cultural omnivore, you know, thesis where, um, community radio listeners um, also consume a vast range of other, you know, di different types of media. Um, and similar, similar to the um, picture Ellie paints in the South African context, community radio audi audiences are growing as well, um, and quite dramatically, you know, and that tells us that um, community media isn't under threat, that it still has a huge role to play. Um, in a society where mainstream mass media is increasingly owned by fewer and fewer small, you know, corporations, um, and where you find a fewer and fewer spaces for people to um, have conversation, particular types of conversations, or put forward different kinds of narratives. Um, I mean, there's a huge critique of media in South Africa, mainstream print and te television, often as being uh, as, as presenting what is what what scholars have termed a view from the suburbs, you know, so being middle-class media for middle-class audiences. And so I think community media, um, radio in particular, plays a massive role in terms of, um, you know, a space where people can see other people like themselves speak where their concerns are addressed, you know, working class concerns are addressed from working class perspectives often. Um, but of course, the flip side of that is that it's often perceived as being kind of poor radio for poor people, you know, so it occupies this very funny kind of in between um, space where it's often not taken seriously, despite the huge growth in numbers, where it's often seen as kind of poor stepchild of traditional mainstream media. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's huge. The part, but I think often we underestimate the power of community media and the numbers really tell a, a bit paint you know tell us the story the you know the numbers are increasing more and more people are listening community to community radio that tells us something about the role it's playing despite the growth of social social media platforms um yeah yeah it, it's um it is interesting also I mean, from what you said earlier about how incredibly important it is to have this sort of real world grounded perspective on what people are actually doing with media I mean, to follow up on, on your arguments about community media, it's, it, I mean, beyond the numbers of people tuning into community media, I would also imagine that when you listen to community media, you get something different from that listening experience than when you just switch on national radio, right? You, you, I mean, it, 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 arguably, it has more impact uh, because it's about stories about people that you know or about a street corner that you live in as well, uh, rather than just somebody playing the latest single of... God knows who is hip these days. I don't know. And, and, and I'm, I'm also thinking about the maker perspective. Like, I mean, I often tell my own students, I don't know about you, but you know, if you really want to have a bit more creative freedom and, and, and come up with new stuff and just put it out on the air, you're better off at local and community media than in some kind of mega mainstream national, because that's, they are all locked in with formats and, 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 and formulas and prescriptions and routines. Um, so, so, but so that real world perspective uh, it, it really speaks volumes. And I, I want to continue a little bit about that because it just, uh, I mean, it's something that bugs me a bit about media studies. And, and I wonder, I would love to get your perspective on this is that 
we have to seemingly seemingly we have to keep reminding each other and and others about how important it is to not just look at the media but beyond the media at what people are actually doing i mean i mean tanya you've got a new book coming out social media and everyday life in south africa and you you talk in the book every chapter starts with a very personal story like something you've seen in, in your environment, in your family, with your friends or among your students, like how they use Tinder or something like that. And that prompts a study and an investigation that together forms this really beautiful book. And, and, and Ali, um, um, uh, I, I found an interview uh, with you last year and you wrote something there, or you said something in an interview that I just wanna quote briefly because I think it's a beautiful point. You say community broadcasting takes the stories, ideas, and information that are important to people in their place and makes that the focus. And in the process, it re reorients the world. And we don't need algorithms to do that. We just need to be ourselves. And, and this, this idea of just looking at people as they are, as they live their lives, as they try to make everything work and using media in the process it's almost like you have to keep reminding others that that is that should be the focus of our work. Why is that still so important? I mean, it seems so obvious, but apparently we still have to remind uh, each other and 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 the feel that that is the, at the heart of what we do. What is that about? You think? Look, I in some ways oh, it, there's so much to unpack there but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> platforms and devices are designed by somebody and they can shape what we do and they can influence outcomes but we don't know what those outcomes are until we look closely at how people are using them and what they're using them for and uh, so, so actually I think for me one of the most uh interesting experiences I had was doing some work for a telecommunications company here in Australia uh, on a, a, a word I don't even like, which is cyber safety <laughs> in, <laughs> in remote communities. I, I, I don't like the negative kind of connotations of that phrase, mm. because really what you're talking about is just what are people doing with devices or with platforms or with media or to each other. And in this particular instance, a lot of the problems that we were hearing about in these very, very remote communities, uh, such as things that you might think of as cyberbullying or someone impersonating another person. And if that's an indigenous community and you're impersonating a dead person, that is very taboo and very serious. Mm. Um, but in fact, you know, when you, when, you, when you start to look at what was going on, it was, it was around reciprocity and people using each other's phones because things are shared in communities. But once you, once you have someone's device, it's also easier if you're a young person to be a bit mischievous and a bit wrong and a bit hurtful and to say something on their social media profile, which then leads to all kinds of problems in the community and it goes on and on and on. But so the question for me then is what is going on there? Is it, is it the device manufacturers who are responsible? <laughs> Clearly the young people have agency in doing this in the first place. Um, and then there's the outcome. So what is, what is the effect of that on the community and the people? Um, so that's a kind of negative example of why it matters to really look at what people do with media or with devices or with platforms, because we can make assumptions and we don't necessarily know what's mm. going on. Um, and interestingly, in that project as well, um, we came across a platform that was being used because it was, um, it, it, it had a very strange billing situation where it was it seemed it was seemingly free to use this particular chat app except that it would be deducted from your prepaid uh, mm. account without you knowing it but you could also download it on your grandma's phone and she wouldn't know that it was coming off her prepaid credit so <laughs> it was a very predatorial app and one mm. that I wasn't particularly um in love with at all and I've, I've just thought that this had all kinds of problems 
And in fact, I think it did when you're talking about financial inclusion or um, other kinds of issues around, you know, products and services related to platforms. But then again, you know, how do I know what those young, young people were doing or how they were using it or why they were using that one over Facebook or what it meant when you are out of credit and you need access to a service and this is the only one you've got. So, I mean, in the end, the telecommunications company did get rid, rid of that app because they agreed that it was a bit suspicious in the way it was financially preying on people. Um, but, you know, I, I'll always feel a bit hesitant about that recommendation and about what we said, because maybe some people, some young people found value in that app and their social groups were using it in ways that I couldn't understand. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that that's really interesting, Ali. And I think, Mark, you ask a really important question, like why do we need to keep reminding people that this is important work, you know, that we need to be asking how people are, are actually using media. Um, so just to come back to that briefly, I think that audience research is just really difficult, you know. <laughs> uh, I think that audience re research is very time consuming and very difficult. You need extended amounts of time in the field, you need field work, you need to do kind of deep ethnographic work, you know, or survey based research, which is perhaps problematic um, deep ethnographic qualitative work is probably going to give you more insights into how people are, are using media um, and then I think I mean we talk about um, you know who controls these the platform who owns and controls sort of algorithmic power with respect to the platforms that we study but I think we also uh, you know maybe quite cynically to say that academia that the work that we do we, we are also controlled in many ways you know, we are under lots of pressure in terms of where we publish, um, what kind of work we produce, um, what kind of work is valued, you know, in terms of scholarly journals and academic conferences. And, you know, there's a massive, you know, global north-south divide, you know, mm. if the kind of work that's been published, you know, where stuff from Africa is considered to be kind of area studies or case study work or, you know, so that they are, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I can't even begin to really unpack that, but there are some really huge issues, I think, also in terms of the academic project and, you know, who controls um, what we write about and how we write about that. And I think that one of the reasons perhaps that people, that, they, that there isn't the strong scholarly focus on individuals agency when it comes to the use of particular kinds of tech tools is just that quite simply, I think audience research is, we seem to have moved away to some extent from audience research traditions um, and audience research as a methodology can be quite difficult. So I think people stay away from it. It's easier to analyze content um, than to do wide, widespread kind of longitudinal research on people and audiences and, and how they are actually using media. I mean, I tried to do that a little bit um, in my book, but even so my samples are really tiny and it, it really just starts to get at the issue. Um, you know, it, it's hard to make broader generalizations about South Africans with the kind of limited small samples that I, that I use in my own work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 but it's interesting. I mean, in, in one of the interviews in this series, I talked with Sonia Livingston about this as well, and she's, she she echoes your sentiments, right? I mean, on the one hand, how incredibly important it is not just to study people and what they actually do, or in her case, often children, right, and what they do with media, but then also to advocate for their voices, mm. right? And 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 that's something both of you consistently do throughout your work. And and I, don't, I mean, in that ad advocacy. I mean, it's easy to be sort of become cynical or at the very least very critical about what's going on. And I mean, you've mentioned the role of, of, of mega corporations in the media sphere and, and, and all the powerful sort of commercial and, 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 and other interests that sort of dominate discussions about media in, in everyday life. But in, in, in your work, for both of you, I often find a distinct or a deliberate sense of hope uh, uh, that things can be different, right? I mean, uh, by, for example, deliberately focusing on examples or cases where things are done differently or where stuff is happening that it is one way or another different from what we may expect in, in, a, in an environment like that or where people find all kinds of agencies 
uh, some large, some, some, some small, some tiny, that are meaningful to them and, and that aren't packed in the traditional discourse around a particular medium or media environment. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that perspective on, on user mobilization, on agency, on, 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 on hope um, that you have, because it, it, it seems to possibly resolve a tension that we have in the literature on media, right? Between on the one hand, seeing media as empowering and emancipatory, on the other hand, by focusing on media as in terms of all the constraints and enclosures that were become part of, uh, because of, you know, there's only a handful of technology companies that rule everything or only, only five mega corporations control all the content. And, so we always seem to be going back and forth in our field between those two perspectives. But in your work, you sort of sort of niftily seem to be moving around it and, and embracing this notion of hope. And, and, I mean, perhaps I'm reading it wrong, but that's how it, how it inspires me. Could, could both of you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, I mean, my answer is quite brief to that. So maybe <laughs> I'll go first and say that when, when you when you frame that question what immediately comes to mind for me in my work um, is some of the stuff I've, I've done around wearable technology and self-tracking you know there's a lot of critique of that kind of technology from the from the field of surveillance studies for example um, and I think a really interesting interesting example of people's agency around that is some work I've done on, a, on an app that people use for sports tracking which has been described as kind of the, you know, gamifying the gamification of, of self tracking and, um, and and sports tracking, um, and the idea that this this particular app um, is inscribed with Western values, pro problematic Western values of co competitiveness. Mm -hmm. um, now, in my research, I found that South African users um use this app in very different ways to what you might imagine it was created for so they move completely away from those kinds of western notions of competitiveness and instead use the app um as a as a form of community building and to encourage each other you know so so absolutely i think there are small instances and glimmers of hope as as you put it i, I like the way you phrase it um glimmers of hope all is not doom and gloom i think there are you know individual users have got lots of agency and i think um people in local context context often use technology in ways other than they might have originally been intended and take ownership you know of 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 um, technology in, in particular ways to to localize it um, uh, as such and to move away from you know the problematic notions of, of surveillance and control um, and, and so on and I think the use of South Africans use of that particular sports tracking app is a great example of that where you've got this western built app that's all about competition and who's the best and who's got the fastest time on the segment um, and then you've got local users that are using it more for kind of encouraging each other um, as opposed to competition. <laughs> right. Yeah, that is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ali, do, 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 you, do you see that as well? Yes. I mean, I think for me, one of the things that I've always obsessed about is what does it mean to scale up from that as well, though? So, and, and I think some of the work that I was doing with a former colleague, Aneta Polkalichka on so social innovation media was looking at where you have these very deliberate entrepreneurial attempts to use the media for good in the world. And I suppose that was a kind of optimistic piece of work because mm -hmm. we did find that there are many ways that people use media to try to do good things and create change. And, really defining social media as that, uh, sorry, social innovation media as something which is a concerted effort. It's not social change that just happens because people are behaving certain ways or we have these uh, new affordances through technologies or whatever it might be, but where there is a very, very specific effort. And often those efforts, and this comes back to what we we're talking about before, they only succeed because people have local knowledge or because there are people who have connections in a community or to an issue or a topic that are able to then create change through that and make that work. Um, so I think for me, I, I, I've had an interest in where those efforts occur 
and mm -hmm. what makes them possible. So for me, community media is one of those infrastructures. It's a platform on which those local efforts and those concerted efforts to do something that will produce a social benefit can occur. Mm. Um, and then you have infrastructures which, um, yeah, things, good things happen on them, bad things happen on them. And one of the examples we used in that book was, you know, crowdfunding platforms. So you can use them to raise funds for charities or for, you know, some kind of local fundraiser or filmmaker or whatever it might be. Or you can use them to fund really hideous things um, that, uh, you know, teach men how to prey on women was one of the, the books <laughs> that I think raised many, many times what it was after um, on Kickstarter. So the platforms themselves are not necessarily inherently good or bad. It's what we do with them. And I, for me, I, I always, um, I think about outcomes and capabilities when trying to work through this. So what is it that a platform enables us to do? Is it an enabling platform? And what are the capacities, I suppose, in the Amatia Sen framework that arise from that, the capabilities that we have because we have um, the ability to use this. Mm. So with something like crowdfunding, that definitely changes, I suppose, what local organizations are able to do to raise funds, and that's really important. And then the outcomes from that may be beneficial. So I think that um, I, I do definitely have an interest in platforms and the, the way that they work and what they enable or constrain. And that is always shifting. And we see that with Facebook which is not a platform I'm an expert on at all, but the way that it, it allows news that's sometimes and not others. You know, we've seen here in Australia with the uh, back and forth over um, our government essentially asking Facebook to pay mainstream news providers and for a time their community media was yeah. not able to use Facebook because of that, even though they were never going to see any returns from that deal. Um, so there are, you know, these, these platforms have immense power and what we need are more platforms which are designed in ways that can be used for um, the good stuff too and, and where we can have control over what that looks like and how it works and who it gets to. So that's where community media is an important platform, albeit one which I think is very marginal because of the policy context in which it has to operate and the minimal amount of funding and the rest of it that it has to work with. Mm. Uh, and then we have more experimental things that are starting to pop up, like distributed technologies. Right. I mean, and then and, and, and these contexts, I mean, yes, both of you obviously are also critical of the media and you written extensively about that, about, you know, how it may, can sometimes contribute to the marginalization of, of particular voices, the poor indigenous communities. Um, but then you often, from that hope of perspective, turn that around, like you said, Ali, uh, to focusing on capabilities. I really like that. Uh, um, and also with specific reference uh, to the people making those, those media. Uh, focusing on what they can or actually are doing differently. I mean, Tanya, you've written in the past about, I mean, how journalists in, in community uh, media organizations use social networking sites to reach out to their audiences and often also to audiences that may not directly be related to the, for example, the radio station, but that, uh, that so in that role, that way a platform can contribute to, to, to broadening the scope. Uh, and, and Ella, you like the project you just mentioned that you did with Anna on using media for social in innovation. It's like, you know, it's just a range of case studies about um, people doing things differently. Um, now, I, 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 I wanted to ask a, 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 a question about this in terms of our students. I mean, because next to our role as researchers, we all, you know, teach uh, uh, um, an extraordinary uh, amount of kids uh, every year. Uh, whether online or hopefully offline soon. And 
and, and I'm assuming for a moment that we have a shared experience in that the majority of the students that enter into our kind of courses, some courses on media and communication, enter those courses because one way or another, they're kind of thinking about pursuing a career in all of this, uh, which could be in radio or television or games or advertising or God forbid journalism, but, but they're, they're, that, that, that's, what, that's often a primary motivator. And I'm, I don't know, I mean, this is not a scientific observation, but I'm beginning to notice that there, I mean, when I look, for example, at applica applicants to our journalism program in Amsterdam, it's like they're increasingly talking about what they want to do in terms of the, the common good. They want to do something good for the world and for society. They want to make people's lives better in a certain way. It's less about, you know, I want to have a byline on the front page of this newspaper they don't even mention newspapers anymore, but but it it, it seems to be and it, or or they want to make something beautiful. I mean, I mean, we, we we've seen research among journalism students around the world that suggests that creativity is a key motivator for them to to choose journalism, which is kind of interesting. Um, and, and I wonder if that's something you see as well. This this notion of uh, uh, maybe have perhaps a shift away from kind of commercial or self-promotional goals as a motivation to work in the media to using media for good and 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 like you said Ellie in the beginning of our conversation today that 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 you realize the media is is not about you but it's about the voices of others and how you can help in in promoting and supporting that I mean or is that too naive that I'm that I'm seeing this but or, or is it something you see in the, the conversation you're having with your students as well it's interesting we don't see it as much as you might expect in South Africa um, mm. given our historical context and I think um, perhaps it's because people a lot of people have lost faith in mainstream media you know I think um, a lot mm. of people in the South African context think that the media should play a much stronger role in terms of um, being critical, um, holding government to account, um, you know, etc. So interestingly enough, we don't have a large interest from our students in terms of, it's the other way around actually, we've got a massive interest in the creativity that you, that you talk about. Everyone wants to make a film or a podcast or, you know, right. um, us to encourage people to to engage in um, more social responsive kind of work is sometimes a little bit more it's often a little bit more difficult um, so that's interesting that you're seeing that trend and perhaps it has something to do with context mm. so I think in an African context people are concerned about finding work you know so that's quite often you know the, the, the most asked question when parents bring their their um, children to the open information day at university and they eventually end up at the media studies table and they ask me well what kind of job would my child have if they majored in media studies and I have to mm. make something up that's useful to tell them <laughs> well, to become a journalist or work in PR or you know, so I think there's that, there's that commercial imperative people concerned about work and so there isn't such a strong focus strangely enough in the South African context from students wanting to do good but there is a massive interest in kind of creativity um, and people wanting to do creative things to make films feature films fiction films um, and, and that sort of thing a stronger interest in that than in documentary um, you know which I think is quite worrying actually for us as media teachers in the South African context. Yeah, yeah, and, and and Ali, I mean, I mean, of course, the same question to you, uh, but also maybe specifically, I'm also thinking about um, um, when we're thinking about the work that both of you are doing and how it relates to the industry and to the people making media. I mean, uh, like for example, the work that you're involved in right at the moment on blockchain. You specifically link blockchain technologies also in to creative industries. And how creative industries could benefit or what parts of creative industries could be improved or um, empowered through blockchain and what parts are actually uh, could be really problematic and and so there is again that that focus i'm seeming to find uh, uh, on a sort of a hopeful account and an account for, of using these technologies such as blockchain you call them corporation machines um, uh, for the greater good and uh, is that something that is also inspired by what you see among students or, or, or is that something you still have to kind of uh, explain to them that that's also possible, perhaps like in, in Tanya's case? I think we need to be 
a bit cautious about wanting to do good actually mm. and that being the motivating force i mean i i think of it what was it coney 2012 or oh. whatever it was that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah you know the american filmmaker who tried to expose some grievous horrible things going on and ended up working in favor of them i can't even remember the details but that often trying to do good through the media ends up speaking on behalf of people that you shouldn't try to speak on behalf of. Mm. Um, and that really the best way to move forward is with um, a desire to learn and to, I think, be creative, absolutely, and with a curiosity about the world. So I think that the best documentaries come from that position as well, rather than necessarily trying to fix things because often we get it wrong mm. um and i think we're seeing a lot of that in blockchain at the moment <laughs> so there are so many uh you know ideas and so-called use cases about how this technology could change or solve the world and some of them are just plain wrong and stupid if nothing else um, <laughs> You know, I, someone was telling me the other day about um, a blockchain based consent app for how you can know who someone on a dating app is and give right. your consent to how far you want to go with that person. I mean, that is just plain ridiculous. And <laughs> I also think not necessarily what that technology is, is about. Um, Certainly it has really interesting new uh, ways of doing that we couldn't really have before. And a lot of them are quite administrative or market-based or economic. Um, and, and for me, I think that's where some of the interesting stuff is. So you mentioned artists and the work that I was looking at there around creative industries work and potential for blockchain. Some of that is because the systems or the players within these industries are um, either complicit in practices which do not benefit artists. They benefit, say, record companies or um, ticketing agencies or whatever it might be, but are not necessarily going straight to the pr producer. Um, and also, I think that creative workers can spend an awful lot of time wound up in things like contracts or boring administrative work that as technology starts to improve we might be able to overcome some of that and we've seen since since I started doing that work and um, talking about blockchain in the creative industries for some cultural institutions here in Australia we've seen this just crazy explosion of interest in NFTs non-fungible tokens right um, but they're kind of an interesting example of where there can be good and where there can be harm. I mean, we, we can see that you could easily create quite volatile ma art markets through the use of these where people are, you know, just setting up multiple accounts and essentially selling artworks to themselves and bumping the price up so that someone else pays too much for it. I would say that that's not necessarily unique to blockchain. Um, mm -hmm. There was a whole movement called zombie formalism where uh, Wall Street traders did exactly that with a particular group of artists, um, I think back in the 80s or 90s. So these types of um, phenomena happen everywhere. But what is interesting about blockchain is that you don't necessarily have to have a centralized controller or um, server or pool of data that you are providing for these things to function and work. So it's the distributed nature of them that matters. And that's where I think we'll start to see some really interesting creative ideas start to emerge. Um, I was talking to a programmer the other day who's working with musicians to create generative music NFTs 
Oh, wow. um, but instead yeah. of um, buying them through these platforms, you actually have to mine them and use the technology itself in order to be able to um, bring them into being. Uh, so, you know, there are some really fascinating and interesting experiments occurring um, alongside, I suppose, the more uh, popular and um, sometimes problematic uses that we hear. I'm pretty hopeful about these platforms because what we're, what we're essentially talking about with creative practitioners is sole traders and they're up against huge corporate players all the time when it comes to distribution of works and the like. Uh, so if there are platforms, which I suppose are more peer to peer or um, equalizing in terms of those power relationships, then that should be good for artists. It doesn't mean there won't still be a role for promoters and gallery owners and all of those people who connect artists or created creators to buyers and mm. audiences but that the economics of it changes because we now have a fundamentally different infrastructure that we can utilize so it has been really interesting seeing that happen um really only so far in two parts of the world one is the financing industry with decentralized finance DeFi, and the other is with artists so it's, it's, it's kind of great that distributed technologies that one of the first groups to really embrace it and start using it are people who um, are just out there creating stuff. Yeah. That sounds a little bit like the origin story of the internet, right? I mean, the artists were among the very first groups to really use it and, and infuse it with life. I think that's right. And it is. I mean, we call it Web3. It is. All right. Yeah. It is the next version of the internet, absolutely. Um, and I think it is still very much where the internet was in 1996, where a whole lot of things will bubble up and then fail and we don't really know what it will be best for. But I think we can say for sure that where the internet was really terrific for communication and information, this is about moving value. So this is about the economics. This is about how markets move. And if, if we want to circle back to the doing good, that there are new possibilities for how to fund things. Um, for instance, one of the crazy applications doing quite well out there at the moment is something called Pull Together, which is a protocol. Um, it's essentially a no loss lottery. So you connect your wallet to it and uh, you go in a lottery and you can't lose. So if you don't win the lottery, you just get your money back. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, but someone wins the lottery. And that, that is essentially interest that's been earned through this application, um, playing DeFi protocols and, and making money through so-called yield farming and all these fancy finance things. But you, you can start to think, well, what does that mean for donations or lotteries where a portion of of the winnings uh, go back to um, a charity? Or what would it mean, for instance, for people to be able to uh, mine Bitcoin using solar energy to create sustainable communities? Um, you know, there are so many new options because of this infrastructure that we haven't even begun to tap into because not enough people really know about it yet. Mm. But yeah, they're the kinds of things that I hope will pop up. Nice. Well, thanks to you, we'll learn more about it in the years to come, uh, for sure. So I, I want to, um, uh, if I may have a couple more minutes of your time, conclude our conversation with uh, something a little bit more personal. I mean, both of you do or want to do um, all kinds of creative work next to your work as a scholar. I mean, I mean, I mean, Tanya, you still. Uh, I, I'm assuming you still have your own ra uh, a radio show uh, at uh, Fine Music, and 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 Ali, I've 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 heard that you were writing or planning to write science fiction. Yeah, <laughs> we'd love to hear more about the radio show and about the science fiction, but I also want to know uh, perhaps like how important 
that kind of practice is for you I mean, both personally but also as sort of perhaps to balance out the work that we do as academics or perhaps you see that as as informing uh, or inspiring uh, each other i mean how do we i mean for me it's like i mean i play in a band and i couldn't imagine life without that even though i suck and we suck but that's fine but but so how how is that how is that for, for, for both of you and i mean if and if anybody is watching this and wants to get or listening to this and wants to get some advice like how 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 do you balance these things that's a that's a really tricky question <laughs> Is it a question about work-life balance, I guess? Um, the, the radio show's on, on a break at the moment, but um, I think for me, the creative aspect is a really important part um, because I think academia or academic work or, you know, trying to be a scholar isn't, we're not one-dimensional beings, you know? And so for mm -hmm. me, that kind of work um, isn't one-dimensional work. I think it sort of operates within a broader, uh, you know, within a broader context. So for me, the creative um, part of life, in a sense, is quite important uh, for a number of reasons. You know, it's kind of therapeutic. It's it's often the space where you make sense of complex theory while you're doing something creative. Mm. You know, um, I also do a little bit of creative writing and I play musical instruments as well. I play the piano and the violin, you know. So, so, so for me, that kind of creative practice um, I think functions alongside the scholarly work. Um, you know, it's, it's a kind of work-life balance and sometimes they overlap, you know, so sometimes like in the case of my um, practical work in, in radio, there's sometimes an overlap with the scholarly, um, you know, so sometimes they operate kind of in parallel, parallel the scholarly practice and the creative practice um, and sometimes they overlap and I think for me it's really just about this idea that scholarly work and being an academic isn't really just one dimensional we're much more complex beings and that kind of creative practice um probably helps us um function better in the academic context often you know i find it quite common actually that many academics do, do either as you say play in a band or write science fiction or right you know, do kind of do some kind of creative work it seems to be quite seems to be quite common um or, or sport you know for me spending time outdoors and, and hiking um is a very important part of what helps me to function in a sense in a, in a scholarly kind of um, sense um so so yeah i see them as kind of par parallel things that often intersect you know where the creative can sometimes um, just be a, an avenue for you to think through some of the com more complex scholarly issues or it can um, often flag interests for you in terms of you know what what you're interested in researching or it can highlight areas of, of interest for you uh, as in the case of working in radio you know for, for example um, yeah <laughs> how's that for you Ellie yeah look uh, well speaking of I suppose just different ways of communicating ideas. One thing I've started doing in recent years is doing audio documentary style podcasts, um, oh. which is, I think, a bit amusing for people in the community media sector who know me as the community TV person. I finally, finally accepted that audio may be the superior medium. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I do a podcast called Disconnect, which is on the work of um, the internet in remote Aboriginal communities with a uh, friend and colleague, Tyson Yankaporter, um, who's an Aboriginal scholar and and what's great about that is we actually get to use people's voices and have them tell their of their experiences and their stories around the internet in remote parts of this country. Uh, so that's been really fun, so much so that I'm about to start one on blockchain. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Which it, we, I don't have a title yet. The working title is mutable, as in the opposite of immutable. Um, because the world is always changing, even if blockchains are not. And the, yeah, so that, that, that's, um, that's fun and really trying to look at that through or, or, almost like a technology teardown where we pull apart an app or a particular blockchain innovation in each episode and go right down to the code and then talk about how it's being used and all of that. So that's heaps of fun. 
the science fiction thing, um, I have to say, I haven't been hugely successful at that because I think trying to do writing as a hobby when you're an academic is, it's not a great choice because you're sitting at a computer all day already. You're kind of doubling up, yeah. 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 <laughs> but when I do do it, I love it because it, you know, I think that the future is, um, it's in the making now, that's all it ever is. The future, there is only the here and now and whatever the future is, we're creating it. Um, mm. And science fiction for me, I suppose, is just a space to have the, yeah, I suppose the more outrageous ideas that I don't get to do in my science fact work, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is the day job. <laughs> and I, yeah, I'm, um, I, I'm enjoying it. I, I, I don't know if I'll ever share it with the world. If I do, I'll let you know, Mark. Yeah, a science fiction podcast, <laughs> Ellie. That would be awesome. Yeah, oh, I love science with, like with sound yeah. effects. Like, whew, whew, yeah. whew. <laughs> <laughs> the thought that has occurred to me. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Ellie, so much for for taking the time out of your schedules today um, and, 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 and share about your work and about all the things you're doing and thinking about doing. <laughs> and, and let's hope we can uh, do this again in the real world with real people and sharing a glass and a moment together somewhere, whether it's Australia or South Africa or somewhere else. But for oh, now, it just be thanks. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Cheers. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.